So what you see up there is a rough approximation of my career path up to this point, <laughs> up to about five years ago. It's sort of like Mo. I, tra I trained to be an anthropologist. That's what I want. All I ever wanted to be. And when I graduated from many, 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 many years in school, there were no classified ads for anthropologists. And so I started to make stuff up, and that became my career path. And I shifted direction a lot. And the main reason is I kept, you know, I would, I have gotten to work on a lot of really cool projects with cool people, but I always go, that it didn't, it never like hit home for me, and I was always searching for something next. And I talked earlier about the call, is sometimes it takes a long time. You know, I'm not 25. Sometimes it takes a long time to figure out your call. And I feel like I finally have. So a lot of people have given a shout out to National Geographic. Uh, so five years ago, National Geographic asked my husband and I if we could design a web-based platform for high school kids that would build world-ready citizens. And when they asked that, suddenly everything I'd done in my life came together. And I finally found something that wasn't, I was not, not gonna get bored. And I, am, I, I just can't wait to get up every morning. I feel like I finally have found my call. So I want to start out by dispelling a few myths about education, because there's a lot of people talking about education right now. And you hear things like the United States is 14th in reading and 17th in math and 24th in science. And everybody's pulling out their hair and saying, we're falling behind the rest of the world. This is terrible. This is terrible. So I want to dispel that myth, because if you look at test scores, international test scores, and you look at the order of the countries, and then you look at childhood poverty, there's almost a one-to-one -one correlation, with one exception, the United States. And we're 34th in the world in childhood poverty. And so we are actually performing way above we have, what we have any expectation of, and what the national conversation should be is why are teachers in America so great at what they do? That they're able to produce test results so far beyond what should be predicted. So whenever you hear somebody saying, our test results are terrible, say, no, they're not. And that if we are really serious about raising test results, all we have to do is raise the minimum wage to $15, $18 an hour, and I guarantee you the test scores will go up. So the next thing I want to spell is this whole notion of a teacher-centric paradigm. It's kind of educational jargon. Sometimes they call it the sage on the stage. But the idea that the teacher in front of the room delivering content is outmoded. And that what we need to do is flip the classroom. So what, the, what flipping a classroom basically means is that kids do their research on the outside, and what happens in the classroom is an active space. And I agree with that. I, I, I do think we need to flip the classroom a lot in a lot of ways. But I want to just dispel that myth a little bit because what you see up there is a scroll from 1350. And the text under that, and what you see is 24 people in a classroom and eight people are acting out. They're either asleep, gossiping, joking around, flirting, looking at their equivalent of an iPhone and texting. So, and you could go back even further. You could go to Socrates, you can go back even further. So why, and this text underneath the scroll says we need to flip the classroom. We've been saying that for 700 years. It's not because of teachers' unions that we haven't flipped the classroom. It's something far deeper. And I'm not gonna give you a simple answer to that. But I think part of the answer, for those of you who wanna investigate it further, lies in this notion of a partnership paradigm versus a dominator paradigm. So, but let's suppose we agree that we need to flip the, t uh, the teacher-centric paradigm. Teachers are exhausted. I mean, they're the first ones who are ready to make some change. The truth is, we spent about a year following teachers around. It's the most exhausting year I've ever spent in my life. It, it is a hard job. Do not kid yourself, it is really tough. Um, and it's true, the research shows that 90% of activities are passive in the classroom. But the biggest thing you hear people talking about is that we're not preparing our kids for the future. And I also agree with that, but a lot of the solutions that you hear, 21st century skills is great, and when you look at them, it's just basic human, you know, be nice to each other, learn how to talk, have good dialogue, critical thinking, things like that. 
A lot of people talk about STEM, which means science, technology, engineering, math, and I do believe we need to have more STEM education, but a lot of people are settling for that as a way to prepare kids for the future, and I think it needs to go much deeper. So the Guardian newspaper created an interactive grant, uh, a, a graph where you could punch in a birth date. So I punched in for a 15-year-old. So you could punch in your birth date and see what climate change was going to be in your lifetime. So I punched in a 15-year-old. Vaguely ominous. This is the agreed upon global limit, which actually just got changed yesterday. Big Harvard research study has just now changed it to a degree and a half. But we'll stick with two. That looks pretty ominous right there, even more ominous. Okay, and then you put in 25 and 35 years old. So imagine yourself, you know, with the exception of these guys and some of the guys in the back, you imagine yourself being 15 years old and the possibility that by the time you're 35, we will have hit the agreed upon global limit. And it's so interesting to me in working with these kids that so many of the kids talked about climate change and two out of the five projects are about what do we need to do as a planet. So they're feeling it. Another way to present the same information is this. This is the sweet spot. This is our chance to s save ourselves, not the planet. The planet's going to continue. This is our chance to save ourselves. That's the sweet spot for reparadigming right there. And so I believe that the kids who are teens today are going to do a lot of the heavy lifting in this big change that's up ahead. So I want to talk a little bit about what they're walking into. I believe the new economy is five minutes before midnight. I think it's all hands on deck. It's a global Manhattan project. But at the deepest level, I think what we need to train kids for is how to re-paradigm the world. So I want to show you another image. And what you see there is an elementary school, a middle school, and a high school. I exaggerated a little bit for dramatic effect, but I want you to just look at that image. If in fact we have to repaired, if we need to train kids to reparadigm the world, is that going in the right direction? And I think that's the heart of it. So I'm going to give you my three slide solution, and then I'll give you eight, a eight slide deep dive. If we want to re-paradigm the world, I think what we're doing up to third grade, for the most part, is pretty interesting and colorful and active, and I think we're doing pretty good. And then I think we need to go blow through that whole notion and start making classes wild. And I'm going to do a deep dive into what those things mean, but just look at the image, you know, without understanding it, and just going, suppose that was middle school and the beginning of high school. And yes, I also believe the hero's journey should be a big part of education. And that's because teen brains are hardwired for initiation. In the same way that kids who are in, um, you know, th three to six year olds can learn a second language without even trying. Their whole brain is hardwired for language. They don't even have to do anything to learn a language. Whereas we all struggle. Well, teen brains are hardwired for initiation and reparadigming the world. Everything in their brain is designed to do that. And if they're not given that opportunity, they feel frustrated. And so I think th this is the three slide solution. Now I'll go into a bit more depth. So I'm going to give you eight specs for reparadigming education. The first has to do with white space. I think by the time we get in high school, about 50% of the time should be empty and kids should start to figure out what to do with it. Because if you don't have empty space, you never discover that enoughness. I also think we need to do away with subjects. By high school, I think they have some use in the early grades, but I think by high school, we need to do away with subjects entirely and describe big social terrains like social change and transformation and collaboration and send kids out into these terrains to do a vision quest or a project and come back and say, this is what social change means to me. This is what injustice means to me. And this is how I want to relate to it in my life. OK, I won't talk a lot about project space. This is the data on project-based learning is irrefutable. It's the best way to learn and create long-term knowledge because you apply what you know in real life settings. I want to talk about the long-term part. Is we have proven that kids who are 10, 11, and 12 can handle a three-month project space. 
There's rare, a rare senior that is able to do a project that lasts three months long. By the time a senior is in high school, they should have done their first two-year project, in my opinion. So I think a lot of the way school is structured is you have these one-week, two-week, three-week units. I look at what, I, sometimes I've looked at the assignments that a high school kid has, and I go, I would go insane. I would never be able to produce anything. So I think the long term is a big part of it. I think kids need to continually build stuff. It's a way of thinking. Everybody has their way of thinking. Some people think through music or art. I'm a spatial person. There's not enough building stuff. And I think it's a way a lot of people think, particularly boys, and I think boys are getting really left out of stuff in our educational system. Continuous, constructive, collaborative, creative vulnerability. And last but not least, one of my favorite things, design. So if I had, if I said, gave you these specs, and I'd say, everybody go out with these specs and transform your life or transform your class or your business, and let's all come back in a year and see what you did, how you interpreted this. It's kind of imaginative, it's mysterious, you don't quite know what everything means, there's room for you to put yourself into it. If I had put eight bullet points on the, on the board, you would have been asleep by the third bullet point and nobody would do anything. There's a chance you would do something if you were offered something like that. That's what design is. And then I think it needs to be embedded again. By the time you're in high school, you need to be start looking at your, your big story. What is it you're going to be doing? And to have kids being in 12th grade and having no sense of what they want to do in life is a crime. So this is what I'm going to be doing in the next 20 years. <laughs> I'd love to meet other people interested in this. <laughs> Thank you.